Herons. Saskatoon Grasswood. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm always honoured to rise in this place and represent the constituents of Saskatoon Grasswood. Today, I know we are debating the merits and, more importantly, maybe the lack of merits of Bill C-46. It's an act to amend the criminal code and make it consequential amendments to other acts. So, in other words, driving under the influence of drugs, notably marijuana. While this is a topic unto its own, it cannot be discussed, I feel, Mr. Speaker, without reference to the accompanying legislation, Bill C-45, which seeks to use the cannabis legal in Canada. So both pieces of legislation actually go hand in hand. In fact, if it were not for the introduction of C-45, we would have no need, really, for C-46. But here we are tonight debating this. You know, and we've talked for many hours in this House about this bill, and I should note tonight that the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada, during her introduction of this bill, C-46, made a reference. She made a reference to a Saskatoon family, the Vandervoorst family. I'm going to give you some background on this family. They suffered a devastating loss of four family members at the hands of an impaired driver. The date was January 3rd, 2016. Many in my city of Saskatoon call this the worst accident in the history of the city of Saskatoon. And I really wonder tonight if the Minister of Justice, if she knows or appreciates the devastation that this family has gone through in the last year and a half. Well, Mr. Speaker, I do. Because this past February, I phoned the Vanderforest family. They have been in the front page of my newspaper in Saskatoon for the last year and a half. It was one of the toughest phone calls I've had to make. It was a phone call because I knew the mom, Linda. The father I didn't know, Louis. But they lost their son, Jordan along with their daughter-in-law and two grandchildren. But I felt, as a member of Parliament, I need to make the call. And I did. It wasn't in my riding. They live in the northern part of the riding. It could be, uh, the uh, the, uh, it could be uh, Saskatoon University or it could be Carleton Trail. But I had to make that call. And I made the call this past February. It was 13, minutes, or 13 months after the accident on January the 3rd, 2016. They were shaken because the person charged was moved to a healing lodge less than a year after killing four members of their family. Wow. The Vanderforce family, we sat around the kitchen table. I was there at 10 o'clock Saturday morning. I sat around and there was a phone call to the house while we were at the kitchen table with Linda and Louie. And she answered the phone. I said, go ahead, answer the phone. She answered the phone, Mr. Speaker. There was nobody on the end of the phone line. So she said, hello, 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 but there was no answer. So she hung up. So we, we went on talking about the case. They've lost four family members. And wouldn't you know it, about a half an hour later, the doorbell rings. And an unannounced to Linda, a man had been driving around their neighborhood for the last year trying to get the courage to knock on the door or phone the family, saying, do you know what, on January 3rd of 2016, I saw your son, I saw your daughter-in-law, I saw your grandchildren having so much fun at a hockey rink outside in Saskatoon. This man spent 13 months, Mr. Speaker, driving around their house. It took him 13 months to ring the doorbell. He didn't know the family. But you know what? I just happened to be there. This was not staged. Linda went out to the porch and talked to this man for a half an hour. They wept. This man had pictures of her family because they were at a skating rink that day, January the 3rd, 2016. Less than 12 hours later, all four members of that family were killed 
because the person charged was three times over the limit of alcohol. This was one of the most emotional mornings I've ever had. This person didn't know the family, but he spent 13 months driving around that house, getting enough courage to ring the doorbell and said, I care. This is what our communities in this country are going to experience with this bill. There are going to be other families. I just happen to be at this household at this time. We've had, in our province of Saskatchewan, believe me, we've had a horrific record of alcohol in our province. In fact, our province this year started because of this accident that occurred in 2016 of tougher impaired driving laws in Saskatchewan because of it. But as I said earlier, you cannot discuss one bill without bringing the driving force bill into this. Let's go back to the expert task force and their objectives in studying this issue. And I keep hearing the same refrain in reference to this legislation. It will keep marijuana out of the hands of children and keep profits out of the hands of criminals. Do you really believe that, Mr. Speaker? Well, member to hold for a second. I'm starting to have a hard time hearing the member. There's some mumbling and the voices going. It's nice to hear everybody talking together, but if you don't mind, if there's something to talk about a little bit louder, if you can go into the lobby, or maybe just listen to the Honourable Member for uh, Saskatoon uh, Grasswood. The Honourable Member. Well, Mr. Speaker, I wish several of the members across from me would have been with me that, that morning, February 3rd, at their house. <laughs> this is a true story. The legal age for consuming alcohol does not keep alcohol out of the hands of children. It simply means a bit more difficult maybe to get, but it does not keep out of the hands of children who actually want to consume it, or young adults. By the same token, criminals will always have a market for illegal marijuana, and in fact will make underage youth, I believe, more of a target for them. Reduce the burdens on police and the justice system associated with simple possession of marijuana offenses and replace those burdens <clears throat> with the burden of producing an additional 1,165 drug driving recognition experts, bringing the number up to what is actually required today. In fact, in this province of Ontario, that number falls well short, the shortest list in all of Canada. So that number again is 1,165. To ensure Canadians are well informed through sustained and appropriate public health campaigns, and for our youth in particular, ensure what risks are understood. Mr. Speaker, we're only 13 months out from this legislation becoming law, and I have yet to see any kind of campaign or even hear of one being planned. Where is the plan? I have been in many high schools in my city of Saskatoon. I've talked to students in grade 9, in grade 10, in grade 11, and in grade 12. These are the same students that are going to graduate a month from now. There is no plan. There is no prevention plan. There is no education. There is no dialogues with the school boards in this country. The ones that will probably have to talk about this, Mr. Speaker, in every classroom in this country. And yet, not one word has gone out to any education system in this country about this bill. But yet, this is the government of consultation. We hear that every day in this house. Where have they consulted? Where have they talked to school boards in this country about bringing this education into the classrooms? Where it should start. We all know that. We all know the kids at 16 and 17. Where is the consultation in provincial school boards in this country? There is none right now. And we're only 13 months away, Mr. Speaker. And the summer is approaching. There is no national plan. Right now, we hear well, there is a device out there, but yeah, it's not approved. We've also heard tonight who pays for this. Don't know. We've got some money. You know, we put together nine million over five years. We got some money. And yet the municipalities, I sat with my mayor. They're worried about this. I've talked to my attorney general in Saskatchewan. They have no idea where this is going. Thirteen months away, and there's still big questions. So I think as we talk about this tonight, we're on heels of a task force report on this marijuana legislation. There's some serious concerns being raised 
throughout this country, and especially by the Canadian Automobile Association. They say urgent work is needed to be done in order to implement a system that keeps Canadians safe on the road. Mr. Speaker, I experienced hell in February when I went to that House, but I also experienced education. And I'm worried the rest of Canadians need the education, are not going to get it in time. Thank you. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Oshawa. Or sorry, not Oshawa. I'm in the right corner. <laughs> right region. Ajax. Ajax, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're forgiven the hour is late. Uh, I thank the member opposite for his commentary. And, and let me extend uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, to uh, the family he referenced. Uh, my condolences. It's a terrible story. I'm glad that you took time to be with that grieving family. And I think uh, that anybody in this House would share our sentiments, that, uh, that what they went through is a nightmare that we wouldn't wish visited upon anybody. Um, I would say that the problem that we have in this country is that existing policies as they relate to cannabis have been wholly ineffective. Uh, the, uh, the, the rate of, of use uh, for cannabis amongst the younger cohort, so those who would be from uh, under 24 years of age, uh, is around 20 percent, about double what tobacco is, and yet tobacco is legal. And I look at the strategies that were used. I was, I was formerly head of the, uh, the Heart and Stroke Foundation in Ontario. The strategies they used uh, on tobacco to denormalize it, to go after it, to have public education, to do so in partnership with, uh, with government. And I, I think that is a good strategy at getting it, at trying to reduce harm. And when we look specifically at driving, I wonder if the member would agree with me that, that when we look at um, uh, the folks who are driving right now, we have no regime. That, that when you take that incredibly high prevalence rate amongst young people, which is, as I said, in, in not only double digits, but over 20 percent, that those young people who are driving uh, right now, we have no uh, mechanism uh, to help police be able to identify when they are impaired or be able to charge them. Uh, and so does he not see that, that given the, the fact that the status quo has been such an abysmal and abject failure, that that family and every family deserves good, sound policy? The Honourable Member for Saskatoon, Grasswood. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Ajax. You know, we have spent probably 20 years in this country telling people smoking is not good for you. We've had ad campaigns for the last decade on telling people about the effects of smoking, and yet we're bringing this bill forward. We have not educated anyone in this country about marijuana. You know, and it's amazing because secondhand smoke really wasn't realized until five or six years ago. And now we're bringing this bill, we're talking about marijuana, and we haven't linked the two, smoking and marijuana, along with alcohol. Yeah, this is a serious, serious bill, you know, but I think, and I, I appreciate the member from Ajax, but he must know we got to start in school with our education system, and nobody has done that. Nobody on this side of the government has thought about who we're trying to prevent with the marijuana, and that's the ones that are driving vehicles at 16 and 17 years of age. We have time for a very quick question. The Honourable Member for uh, Edmonton's... Uh, you know what? I'm having a hell of a time. I'm sorry, a heck of a time tonight. It's, it's getting late. <laughs> Edmonton, St. Albert. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my friend, the Member for Saskatoon, Grasswood, for his impassioned speech. And he's absolutely right about the need for education and awareness. And uh, we know that with uh, um, the legalization of marijuana, more people are going to be impaired and more people are going to be injured and, and die on the roads. And the member for Vancouver East challenged me when I made that assertion. But one can look at the statistics in the state of Colorado, where there has been a 62% increase in the first year upon the legalization of marijuana in terms of motor vehicle deaths involving drug impairment. Now, the government has boasted about $9.6 million. That's only over five years. I say that is a pittance. I say that is inadequate. And I wonder if the Honourable Member for Saskatoon Grasswood could comment on that. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon Grasswood. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to salute my colleague from uh, Edmonton, St. Albert. He's right on. I mean, you talk about what Colorado has did. 
years ago when they started this marijuana mission. They put tens of millions of dollars into the state about marijuana to educate people, to deal with it. And here, I mean, for over five years, we don't even have $10 million. So yeah, that is a major concern. But you know, let's talk about prevention, because that's our health care, is prevention. And nobody has talked about it on that side. How do you prevent marijuana? How do you prevent kids from taking it? How do you educate them? Nobody has done that. I know because I've talked to the Canadian School Boards Association and nobody from that government has stepped forward and had a plan.